friends, good morning and welcome. I'm Sherry Citrin, Director of the Cancer Resource Center at Virginia Hospital Center. The breast care team at Virginia Hospital Center looks forward to this conference each year. We relish the opportunity to reconnect with our survivors, patients who finished their treatment long ago, to check in on the progress of our patients currently in treatment, and to provide valuable information to our community members interested in prevention and treatment options. Who would have thought that in this, our 31st year of hosting the conference, we'd be meeting virtually? I think we can all agree that this year has been strange. So much has changed in our lives, our world, our country, our homes, and our schools, and even within this hospital. And we may never be the same, but what has remained consistent is that Virginia Hospital Center and the Cancer Resource Center aims to provide the most innovative and supportive care to our breast patients. This hospital has shown its commitment for a very long time to reaching out to the community it serves by empowering patients through educational efforts, providing access to first-class medical professionals, and offering a comprehensive array of support services. As I mentioned, this tradition of an annual conference began 31 years ago when Kathy Dorner, my predecessor, predecessor and mentor, had a vision to put together an event for breast cancer survivors. The concept of survivorship was rarely discussed back in 1989, and advocacy for breast cancer had only recently become mainstream. In fact, the pink ribbon symbol would only make its way in the public consciousness two years later in 1991. So much has changed since then. We now have two breast cancer support groups, one for parents of younger children and a general group. We have classes led by our dietitian and breast cancer surgery team on weight management after treatment. We offer fitness courses to help increase flexibility and strength after surgery. And we collaborate with the rehab team on workshops related to lymphedema and pelvic floor dysfunction. We are so grateful for your willingness to participate in this virtual conference. Coming together every October is the highlight of our year, and it remains true even now. Though today we can't offer those much anticipated conversations or hugs, know that we are still here, ready and happy to help. Whether it's navigating a new diagnosis, helping you plan how to tell your family and friends, weighing treatment options with you, connecting you with community resources, sitting with you in a support group or an individual counseling session, or making nutrition recommendations, helping you find a wig or a new bra, or providing you with some company during a chemo treatment. We are deeply privileged that you have let us into your lives and allowed us to be there right with you during some rough days. And these rough days continue for many of us as we are isolated from our loved ones. Our patients are sharing that feelings of depression and anxiety are growing and they aren't always sure how to manage their medical care. For some, the fears of our cancer recurring or spreading are now intensified with the additional worry about COVID. VHC takes the utmost precautions, such as screening before entry into the hospital and testing before any surgical procedures, but still questions abound. Should they come for their routine screening mammogram and risk getting COVID? Should they put off their planned surgery? Will the chemo make them more susceptible to coronavirus? These are some of the questions that we hope to address today as we try to do our part to help you gain back some sense of control during this time of pandemic. Now, please allow me to acknowledge and say thank you to my colleagues in the Cancer Resource Center, Miriam, Margaret, and Cynthia, 
who have assisted in the planning of this event and who, as many of you know, are just simply the best. If you are struggling to cope or just want someone with whom you can discuss your feelings, please do call on us. We are still offering programming and groups on Zoom, as well as virtual or in-person counseling sessions or consults. On behalf of the Cancer Resource Center, we wish you good health and happiness always, and we will be available for any of your questions or needs after we hear from our panel. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us in our annual conference for breast imaging. I'm Sarah Mesbon. I'm the head of women's imaging. I'm here to tell you about all what we have been doing through this COVID period of time. We have increased our numbers um, in terms of staffing so we can accommodate all the ladies that have missed their screening exams and diagnostic exam during the COVID period of time. We have extended our hours to make sure that we can fit all our patients. We included hours during the weekends on Saturday and Sunday to accommodate everybody. We went through all our records and we made sure all the ladies that have missed their exams were called personally to make sure that we can give them the chance to come and do your, their exams. We please encourage you to come and do your exams. We do not want to miss a year without a mammogram. Also, I keep encouraging you since we're all home most of our times that we continue to do our annual self-breast exams and our monthly self-breast exams and take care of our breast health. Thank you and have a good day. I'm Dr. Claire Edwards and I'm here to talk about breast cancer screening and diagnosis. I work with Dr. Molly Sebastian and Brittany Christopher PA at the Reinch Pierce Family Center for Breast Health. And my message is, please don't let anxiety or fear about the coronavirus pandemic stop you from taking care of your breast health. Virginia Hospital Center is a safe place. The hospital is screening everyone. There's a strict policy that everyone is masked. So the question I will answer with this presentation is, when do you need to come see us at the Center for Breast Health? One reason is, uh, if you notice a change in your breast, please don't hesitate. Um, we should all be practicing breast self-awareness, which means if you notice a lump in your breast or bloody nipple discharge, or really anything that's of concern to you, you should come see us. Um, if you are concerned about the coronavirus and want to minimize trips, and you're not sure if what you noticed uh, warrants a visit, we can do video visits um, and talk through um, whether you, you need to come in for a physical exam with us and most likely an ultrasound. Um, if you're up for doing a more formal um, breast self-exam monthly, um, there are instructions uh, that can be easily found on the internet, such as at breastcancer.org for how to do that in a formalized way, but really, the key is breast self-awareness and um, just letting us or your uh, primary care doctor know uh, if you notice a change. Um, and those who are higher risk, um, just let me remind you that uh, at least yearly, whether or not you're having symptoms, come in for a breast exam with us. Um, that's for those women who have a known genetic mutation or a very strong family history of breast cancer or who are considered higher risk because of uh, perhaps atypical cells on previous uh, breast biopsies. Um, so what about screening? So we're still getting our mammograms yearly at age 40 um, for any normal risk woman. Um, and uh, when you schedule that mammogram, which if you're overdue or due, you, you should go ahead with, um, uh, consider scheduling that as a 3D mammogram, which is also called tomosynthesis. Uh, that technology has been shown to decrease callbacks for additional uh, mammograms, um, as well as uh, increase um, detection of breast cancer uh, by a, a small advantage. Uh, the automated whole breast ultrasound can be used uh, as an additional screening tool, a supplement to the mammogram in those who do have extremely dense or uh, somewhat dense breast tissue. 
so know your density. The uh, high-risk woman who um, has a strong family history of breast cancer um, should be doing mammograms uh, perhaps earlier than 40 um, if uh, someone diagnosed in the family uh, was uh, diagnosed at a young age, then we start those 10 years younger than the youngest person uh, who was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, an annual breast MRI is also um, oftentimes a good option for those who um, are higher risk uh, because um, of a strong family history or uh, abnormal breast biopsies in the past. Uh, and those can be, uh, are not a substitute for the mammogram, but can be staggered with the mammogram and done um, yearly. So uh, hopefully that information uh, was helpful to you. And um, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Good morning. I'm Dr. Molly Sebastian. I'm a breast surgeon here at the Reinch Pierce Family Center for Breast Health and a very proud medical director for our multidisciplinary breast cancer program. I've been tasked this morning with telling you about surgical options for the treatment of breast cancer. I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview that may be uh, something you're already familiar with from to the talks you've already heard from today. Uh, the fact that breast cancer is treated with three different uh, from three different perspectives medically. One is surgery to, of course, remove the cancer. Uh, the other, uh, second is medical therapy, uh, specifically big decisions about whether or not chemotherapy is necessary for a woman in her treatment or can it safely be avoided. And then targeted therapies are some of the most exciting developments uh, in the last 20 years in breast cancer treatment research. Whether or not those will be applicable those are medications targeted to specific aspects of the cancer, and a type of medication called endocrine therapy. There is an entirely separate area of medical treatment uh, called radiation, and that's energy treatment directed at specific parts of the body to help keep cancer gone. When it comes to breast cancer treatment, surgery is usually the first st stage. There are two major goals at the time of surgery. Of course, removing the cancer from the breast is a big priority, but oftentimes it's necessary to remove a few lymph nodes, sometimes uh, an, an entire region of lymph nodes, in order to assess whether or not the cancer spread, or if so, how, how extensive was the spread. When it comes to surgical treatment for breast cancer, there are two strategies that are still uh, uh, a major point of decision making in the treatment process. The first is a strategy called breast conservation that's been around for about 40 years and it's been proven to be equally effective to mastectomy for women who are eligible. Breast conservation consists of the removal of the tumor with a rim of healthy breast tissue. The nickname for that procedure is lumpectomy. And that gets combined with energy treatment, radiation, to safely keep the breast. The second option is mastectomy, and it's a federal law that reconstruction has to be covered by a, the health insurance company so that women can have symmetry and feel comfortable in their own skin as much as humanly we can render that to be the case with the coverage of, of health insurance for the, med for the costs. Breast conservation, the medical term for lumpectomy is partial mastectomy. It's a really important part of the removal of this cancer that the pathologist verify that there are clear margins in 360 degrees around the breast cancer tumor. Those clear margins mean there's clean breast tissue surrounding that specimen. And that's the verification that every detectable bit of this breast cancer has been removed. But we don't trust breast cancer. And so we double down, and it's wise to double down, by covering that area with additional treatment, which is the energy treatment radiation that follows. There, I'm showing a slide of one example of lumpectomy, where it's a limited area of the breast that's affected by the cancer. And that can be excised surgically. 
and then followed with uh, the energy treatment. When the lumpectomy is analyzed by the pathologist, about 5 to 10% of the time, the pathologist finds some cancer at one of the edges, meaning the margins weren't clear, uh, or it's called a positive margin. And that's a nuisance of this strategy that there are some times when women need to go back to the operating room to have that edge cleaned again, and that's called re-excision, and it involves another surgery. But this is a very good strategy for women who have a, an isolated tumor in a breast that they would like to keep. This is a mammogram of a woman who's a good candidate for breast conservation. The area of fine white dots that the red arrow is pointing to are the area of the problem, but you can see from the images there's a lot of healthy breast tissue that doesn't involve those white dots that can be spared. Radiation therapy is delivered in one of several ways, and Dr. Nasser reviewed those with you in his own talk. But briefly, uh, whole breast radiation or partial breast radiation are some of the strategies our patients commonly undergo. Fortunately, many women are candidates for breast conservation, but it's not always the best strategy. And that's why mastectomy is still around as a surgical procedure that's important for some women in their breast cancer treatment. And that can be combined with or without reconstruction by a plastic surgeon. Nipple sparing mastectomy has become the standard of care for women who are eligible. We need to make sure that the cancer is not close to the nipple in a real complex and that the skin envelope and the overall size of the breast is conducive to safely keeping all of the skin of the breast. When this strategy was first developed about seven to 10 years ago, there was a lot of debate about where to place the incision on the skin. And it turns out that we have some options and uh, most, uh, the most favorable location tends to be at the fold of skin at the lower aspect of the breast. That way when there's reconstruction, the incision hides. There's sometimes when it's not possible to keep the nipple and areola, and the mastectomy that's performed in those cases is called a skin sparing mastectomy. The skin of the nipple and areola area, sometimes with additional skin, is removed along with that underlying breast tissue. So with reconstruction, there's a nice shape to the breast tissue, uh, but there's a line where the incision has replaced the nipple and areola. Later, when the skin is healed, women can undergo reconstruction of the nipple and areola to have the appearance of that uh, structure again. So this is a mammogram that's an example of a woman who really doesn't have much of a choice. The, if you imagine that these white areas are uh, areas of tumor, there's no way to preserve that breast safely. So there really are some cases where a mastectomy is necessary. But of course, with genetic testing and personal choice, there, uh, is, uh, there are women who have choices between each of these decisions. So it's important for surgeon, the surgeon taking care of women with breast cancer to have a good conversation with the newly diagnosed breast cancer patient about her options and what fits her lifestyle and her choices best because the treatment benefit of these strategies is equally effective for the majority of people. Of course, testing lymph nodes by removing a couple are, is an important part of the breast cancer surgery. The procedure we perform the most is called sentinel lymph node biopsy, and that's a strategy where we put two kinds of dye into the breast on the day of surgery. One is blue and one is radioactive. They're specially designed to be taken up by the lymphatic plumbing. Those are the pipes that breast cancer likes to travel in if it's trying to spread outside of the breast to the rest of the body. Luckily, that lymphatic plumbing network has its own built-in filter system, the lymph nodes. And those dyes, when they're put in place, are taken up preferentially by the busiest lymph nodes. And the surgeon can identify which lymph nodes are the greediest ones because that's where the cancer would most likely settle if it were trying to spread. So we remove those sentinel lymph nodes that's usually between one and four on the day of surgery for most people. 
when there's been more significant involvement of the lymph nodes with cancer or it's a particularly aggressive type of cancer, there are, there's a, a broader lymph node removal procedure called axillary dissection. We try to help women keep as much of their own native plumbing as possible and try to avoid axillary dissection whenever possible. These procedures have uh, risks of lymphedema and, of course, soreness after surgery. The, the risk of lymphedema increases when the lymph node removal has been more aggressive. And therefore, we try to be as minimally invasive as possible in order to help prevent that condition from developing as much as we humanly can. I hope you've enjoyed your morning in terms of your, what you were able to learn from, about breast cancer from our team. I'm so proud of the team that we've built here at Virginia Hospital Center, and it's a true privilege to be able to take care of patients who are going through these, these decisions. Thank you for spending your morning with us. Hi, everybody. I'm Marilyn Wynn. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon here at Virginia Hospital Center. And I work very closely with Dr. Edwards and Dr. Sebastian um, and the surgery team to provide reconstructive options for patients who are facing breast cancer. So today we're gonna to go through a brief overview of what I would talk about with any patient in a consultation who has a new diagnosis of breast cancer. Oftentimes you're meeting me when you're diagnosed. Oftentimes you're meeting me after you have already been treated for breast cancer and you didn't undergo reconstruction initially and you still have options at a later date. So we'll go through all of these different scenarios. Most of the time that you've seen me, you've already met with Dr. Sebastian or Dr. Edwards and, uh, or your, whoever your breast surgeon is, and um, you may have already decided on lumpectomy versus mastectomy. I believe Dr. Edwards has covered the differences between these surgical options in her um, talk. So you have options for reconstruction in both of those scenarios as well. When you come to me and you haven't decided about lumpectomy versus mastectomy, we can often talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both of those um, options. So part of it will be, be determined by how much cancer is in the breast. If there's a significant amount of cancer in the breast relative to the size of the breast, then you may not be a candidate for lumpectomy. Um, it depends on your breast size and what your goal for your ultimate breast size is. You may want it to be smaller, you may want it to be bigger, you may want no change, and those can um, affect your decision. Um, sensation is different for each option. Um, uh, radiation can uh, make possible or make impossible certain options. And for either lumpectomy or mastectomy, just remember that you have the option for no reconstruction at all. Delayed reconstruction, meaning it's done at a later time after you've already been cured and treated for your cancer, or you can have immediate reconstruction, meaning I get involved at the, at the initial stage. So when you're having a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy, if you have a relatively small tumor in a relatively large breast, you may not need any plastic surgery reconstruction at all. It may leave you with minimal to no defect um, that's noticeable to you, either in or out of clothing. If you undergo no reconstruction, again, there's always the option for delayed reconstruction at a later date. If you have a small area that you notice is bothering you, whether it's a small uh, dimple or divot in the breast or the breast is slightly smaller than the other side, there's a lot of options. So one is fat grafting. We can harvest fat by liposuction from any donor site where it's available and inject it into a small defect. For larger defects, um, you may need something called a flap surgery where you harvest a bigger piece of tissue from a different part of the body and transfer it into the breast. Um, if your breast shape is okay but you're just slightly asymmetric because you've um, shrunk from the radiation on one side, you may choose to undergo a reduction surgery on the healthy breast to make them match a little bit better. So those are the options for delayed uh, reconstruction. Immediate reconstruction when you're having a lumpectomy is usually performed in a patient who has a larger breast that's wanting to go smaller. So we'll use the residual breast tissue after the tumor has been removed and rearrange it in such a way that the breast is lifted and made to be smaller. And you have the option of also treating the other healthy breast so that you maintain symmetry of size and, and contour. 
Next, we'll move on to the options after mastectomy. Again, there's the option for no reconstruction. If the, um, and this is called flat closure often. So oftentimes Dr. Sebastian or Dr. Edwards can perform a flat closure by themselves. If we're worried about having a lot of extra skin that might not lay smoothly, there's a lot of different incisions and different options to tailor that skin so that the chest wall contour is nice and even. There's options for implant reconstruction, and this can either be done in one or two stages. In my hands, most often this is being done as a two-stage procedure with a tissue expander first, which is an inflatable implant. This allows your skin to heal and contract after surgery, and then we eventually expand you or, or inflate the balloon until it's the appropriate size for you or to your desired size and then we'll exchange this for a final implant. This is a good option for patients who are wanting to go slightly larger than their original size or who may be um, losing some skin at the time of surgery and need to have that skin uh, re-stretched with this expander. Um, the pectoralis muscle is often able to be left in place. We used to put implants under the pectoralis muscle, but uh, now we're putting it on top of the muscle. So. The implants are much less um, damaging and painful to the chest wall than they used to be. A lot of patients express concern about implant safety, and we can have a full day conversation about this, but I can assure you that implants are safe, and I'm happy to talk to you about all of the risks and benefits of those if you're interested in reconstruction with implants. And finally, there's flap reconstruction, which means using your own tissue. This is often from your back, from your belly, it can be from your thighs or from your buttock. Um, these procedures are great operations in the right patient. They do require a lot more surgery, a longer hospitalization, and a longer recovery up front. Um, but the reconstruction is permanent. You don't have an implant that you have to worry about over the course of the rest of your years. So that's a brief overview of all of the options that we have available to you. Um, and I'd be happy to see any of you in the office. Hi, I'm Dr. Neela Madindaluri. I'm a breast medical oncologist with Virginia Cancer Specialists and the Virginia Hospital Center Cancer Committee Chair. First of all, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. We're so delighted to do this annually because we believe in the community outreach and education, and we really want to make all of you feel emboldened to make good decisions for your health care. We all know that these have been very transformational, unfathomable times, and we hope that your and yours are safe at home. Please reach out to our entire community if there are things that we can do to help. So on an uplifting note, despite the darkness around us with the pandemic, what I can say about breast cancer is that we are making strides. Part of it is because we have earlier detection, so we're finding cancer earlier where more often than not we're able to cure the disease. The other thing is that we are really transformational in terms of the medications that we have that have really led to great developments and increased survival in many of our patients. So that is where I find hope, is that we live in an era where we're constantly changing, evolving to find better therapies for uh, women or men with breast cancer. So a few things that I want to talk about are, who am I? What do I do? So why does someone see a breast medical oncologist? Well, one reason is to say, can we give medications to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer? The other reason is, is some people say to me, you know, I had surgery. Why do I need to see you? My cancer is out. Well, I like to think of the fact that we're all part of a multidisciplinary team. And the second reason that people see me is that even though the surgeons are excellent, the radiation oncologists are excellent, we can still have cells that we can't see, touch, and feel that can come back years later. And what we often do is give medications to reduce the risk of the breast cancer coming back in the liver, the lung, the bone, the brain, the other breast. So that is the other reason that people see me. The third job I have is sometimes we find breast cancer has come back 
and where it's a chronic disease or what we call stage four disease. So we need to find good medications to help people feel better and keep the disease in control. That's the other job I have. Or some women or men present with what we call de novo stage four breast cancer, where it has already left the barn of the breast and the lymph nodes, and it's in a different place. So those are three of my roles, but really we're part of a team. And my fourth role is that the medications that we do give, how do we help people feel better on them? How do we pe keep people on them? And that's another uh, part of my job is to help facilitate what we call supportive care to say, how do we make people tolerate these therapies as well as they can? The fifth role is that we often identify women or men at higher risk for hereditary cancer. And so taking a complete family history saying, hey, you should really see our genetic counseling team to say, is this inherited from mom or dad? So those are some of my roles. Now, people always ask, what are the developments in breast cancer? Well, one is that we're more personalized about how we treat people. One thing is that we can test to say, is a cancer hereditary or not? Well, we're still at the tip of the iceberg of scientific discovery. We've come a long way at, over the last few decades of being able to identify uh, women or men at higher risk for breast cancer and what are things that we can do to reduce their risk, whether it be surgery or medication. The, that is one big development. The second development is about 80% of women diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, stage one to three, uh, used to undergo chemotherapy. Now we know a subset of these women that with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer, they may not need chemotherapy and they may be able to have great outcomes with what we call anti-estrogen therapy or endocrine therapy alone. And we have tests that identify those patients. The other interesting thing is we know that if someone has stage four um, or metastatic disease, that by and large, there's no role for breast surgery. And that's always a question that we had in decades past. So not having to do breast surgery really reduces the uh, com what we call the discomfort uh, associated sometimes with surgery. Another development is that in stage four disease now, we've always looked at fertilizers like estrogen, progesterone hormone receptors, or another fertilizer called HER2, but we now know that we can send for something called next generation sequencing in stage four disease that really helps us personalize and say, what target do we wanna hit to try and control the cancer? So those are just a few of the developments. Lastly, in terms of developments for medications, we know that we have a plethora of new medications, and I'm not gonna quiz you on this, I promise, after this seminar. Uh, Sasituzumab, TDXD, uh, DS8201, several medications that have been approved over the last year alone to reduce the risk of either breast cancer coming back or those with stage four breast cancer for them to live longer. So those are some of the developments. Now I always say that no medicine is good if you can't take it. So one thing that's very important to our team is to say, how do we help you tolerate these medications better? And lifestyle is very important. So exercise is very important, making sure that uh, we incorporate complementary therapies such as yoga, acupuncture is very important. And sometimes we use low-dose antidepressants to control side effects like hot flashes or nerve damage called neuropathy. And also tolerance. Many women and men don't want to lose their hair if they do need chemotherapy. Now, it's not 100%, but often we can use cold cap therapy to reduce the risk of chemotherapy-induced hair loss. So those are just some of the things that we've done to improve tolerance. And 
there's a lot of anxiety associated with breast cancer. So that's why it's very important that we have the whole team weigh in. We have supportive care physicians that we send uh, our patients to counselors that also improve tolerance. So lastly, I think it's important for all of you to know that this really is a journey if you have been diagnosed with breast cancer and we're all here as a team to help you. And it could be nutrition support, it could be yoga class, it could be acupuncture, it could be physical therapy, it could be the medical oncologist, radiation oncologist. But the whole point is, is we're all a team to help us all, first of all, take care of the breast cancer, but second of all, navigate these unfathomable times. So thank you again for sharing your Saturday and stay safe. Yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Nadeem Nasser, and today I'm going to be speaking about the changes in radiation oncology that have occurred over the last six months with the recent pandemic. Um, we know that some of the strategies that are necessary to decrease the risk of COVID-19 are personal, environmental, and of course, in the actual delivery of the radiation. Now, in terms of personal changes, we've obviously accommodated universal mask use per the CDC guidelines, as well as the hospital guidelines. We are using universal hand washing, hand sanitization, testing when necessary, and then of course social distancing, which can occur of course with physical distancing, but we have also now accommodated telehealth visits to minimize the number of patients going through the department. And we've also attempted to minimize the number of visitors and companions that patients bring with them to the department. Again, all in the name of trying to minimize interactions with others in our department itself. As far as environmental changes go, we've adopted CDC and hospital guidelines in terms of cleaning the department, but we also follow the ASTRO guidelines. Now, ASTRO is the governing body of radiation oncology, and they did put out a series of clinical guidelines on how to maintain a department during this pandemic. And to show how this works, there was a recent study that was published from a cancer center in New Jersey where during the height of the pandemic in May of 2020, they took 128 samples from across the department. That's from staff areas, patient areas, and patient treatment areas. And what they found was that none of the samples showed COVID-19 positivity as long as the proper precautions were taken. As far as breast radiation goes, we've known now for over 30 years that Whole breast radiation is an integral part of the treatment of early stage breast cancer after lumpectomy or partial mastectomy. We also know from these studies that the addition of breast radiation cuts down the risk of recurrence and it also improves overall survival and mortality. But we also know that because of the extent of the radiation, which traditionally was five weeks of treatment, about 30% of women in North America are unable to get the radiation after the surgery, either because of time constraints or costs. As I said, the traditional way to deliver radiation was a daily course of treatment over five weeks. But we also know from many biologic studies that breast cancer is one of the cancers that responds well to higher doses per treatment. And so there was a movement started about 15 to 20 years ago to try to reduce the overall time of treatment from five weeks by delivering larger doses per treatment, something called hypofractionation, and trying to do it all in a shorter amount of time, which is known as accelerated therapy. This is more convenient for the patient. It uh, uses less time overall in the department but it is a little bit more intensive in terms of the expertise needed to deliver this radiation. A recent study this year looked at over 40 smaller studies trying to use these hypofractionated accelerated techniques. And the take home from this meta-analysis was that 
the use of the shorter courses of treatment resulted in similar cancer outcomes, including survival and local control, and it also resulted in very comparable toxicity, either in the short term or the long term. Now, there are two different thoughts on how to deliver hypofractionation. One thought is to deliver hypofractionation to the entire breast, as was done with the five weeks of whole breast radiation. The other school of thought looked at just treating the area of highest risk, also known as the lumpectomy cavity, either by doing it with a internal radiation delivery system called brachytherapy, or more recently, doing it with external radiation. So the whole breast hypofractionated treatment, this is again treating the entire breast with a shorter course of radiation. As I mentioned before, there's multiple different studies that have looked at doing this, but the main one with the most robust data to back it up is a study that came out of Canada that compared a five-week course of radiation to a shorter course of three weeks. And what that study found with 10 years of follow-up is that there was no significant difference in local control, no significant difference in survival, and also no differences in both the acute and long-term toxicities. The second option, as I mentioned, is to simply just treat the lumpectomy cavity, which is the highest risk area of recurrence. Over the past decade at Virginia Hospital Center, we've treated over 1,000 women with this technique where after the surgery, a specialized catheter is placed inside the breast at the site of the lumpectomy, and then using a machine called an afterloader to deliver a small radioactive seed to a predetermined position in that catheter, we give 10 treatments over a five-day period by doing two treatments a day. This method gives us a much better way to control where the radiation is going and allows us to treat the lumpectomy cavity while allowing us to avoid the structures nearby like the chest wall, the lungs, the heart, the skin, and the remainder of the breast. The downside of this technique, obviously, is that a catheter has to be placed, which requires a second surgical procedure, and also the catheter has to remain in the breast for that entire week of treatment, which can be cumbersome for some women. These this method has been looked at in two major randomized trials where it was compared to the traditional five weeks of radiation. And both the RAPID trial and the NSABP B39 trial showed very similar cancer outcomes and toxicity profiles when compared to traditional five weeks of whole breast radiation. The third option is to, again, treat only the part of the breast that is affected, but do it using an external beam radiation technique called IMRT, which means that we don't have to use the catheter anymore. Um, this is a method that's been in development for over a decade, but the most recent, most robust study was published just this year from Italy, where they compared the five weeks of traditional whole breast radiation to five treatments of external radiation right to the lumpectomy cavity given over a, a non-consecutive schedule, meaning an every other day period. And again, what that study showed with 10 years of follow-up is that there was no difference in cancer outcome and no difference in side effects when compared to traditional treatments. And so with these three options of shorter hypofractionated radiation, we can really pick and choose the best option for women with early stage breast cancer to give them the best possible treatment while minimizing their exposure to the department and obviously to COVID-19. Thank you. Hi everyone. So we're gonna just take a short stretch and movement break after listening to the morning sessions. So just remember that exercise and stretching is really important in re your recovery from any cancer treatments. But we wanna go ahead and just wake some of our muscles up and we wanna really be mindful of our posture. So you can do these in standing if you want. I'm gonna stay seated. And first thing we wanna do is just go ahead and think about that posture. We wanna engage our abdominal muscles. So you wanna pull that belly button in towards your spine. Keep a nice straight back, but make sure you're not holding your breath as you do this. 
Okay, if you're sitting, you wanna keep your feet flat on the floor with your knees just above your ankles. And now we're gonna think about that back posture. So we wanna take our shoulders and you wanna bring them back and down. Think about squeezing something behind those shoulder blades. And as you do this, go ahead and take a nice deep breath in and then out through your mouth. And then you can go ahead and relax and we're gonna do that again. So go ahead and squeeze those shoulders back, making sure they're pulled down from your ears and take a nice deep breath in and out through your mouth. And let's do that one more time. So shoulders back and down, nice deep breath in and out. Okay, so next we're gonna do is some marching. So you can stay in your chair and you're just gonna bring your legs up as high as you can. So that may not be very high, it may just be a few inches. Maybe you can get those knees up pretty high. You just wanna do this nice and slow and controlled. Again, just getting these muscles moving after we've been sitting for a while. So we're gonna do this just for a few more seconds. Make sure you're breathing again through all of these exercises. Good. And then we can go ahead and give it a stretch. So you're gonna take your knee, you can grab your left knee with both hands and you're just gonna pull it into your chest. Again, it may not wanna come real far, that's okay, just bring it as far as you can. And we're just gonna hold this for a few seconds. And then you can let that leg down and you're gonna go ahead and grab your right knee with both hands and pull that in. And again, just feel a nice good stretch. I'm gonna hold it for a few more seconds. Good, and you can go ahead and let that release. Okay, next we're gonna do some arm circles. Get those arms to wake up. So you're gonna put your arms at your side and you're just gonna do some circles coming forward. Again, just nice and controlled. Think about your back, you want a nice straight back when you're doing these. And then you can go backwards with those arm circles. Good, and then so what we're gonna do now is just a nice stretch of the arm. So you're gonna take your left arm and you can reach for your right arm, you can reach at your forearm or your upper arm, and you're just gonna pull that right arm across your body as much as you can. And again, if you're only here, that's fine. Just a nice, good stretch. And we're gonna hold this for a few seconds. And make sure you're taking some nice, good, deep breaths in and out, sitting up nice and straight or standing up nice and straight. And then you can relax that right arm, shake it out. We're gonna do the same thing with the left arm. So you're gonna grab your left arm with your right hand and just pull it across your body and you get that nice stretch in the back of your shoulder. We're just gonna hold this for a few seconds. And again, just taking some nice deep breaths. And then you can let that arm down and shake it out. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna work on the neck. So we're gonna do some neck exercises to strengthen the back of the neck. So what we're gonna do is this neck retraction, bringing the chin back as though your chin and eyes are staying level, but you're tucking that neck back. And this is really good to do, to strengthen these little muscles, especially when we're looking at computers all day, phones all day, and the neck is down. And so we're just gonna do a few of these. And these you can do throughout the day. Okay. Now I'm gonna have you go ahead, you're gonna interlace your fingers, you're gonna put them behind your skull and we're just gonna push our head into our fingers and you're gonna start to look up bringing your head back and just get a little neck extension stretch and again we're just gonna hold this for a few seconds and we want to really be mindful of the neck especially looking at screens during this time that you're not just hunched forward you want to make sure computer screens are right in front of you so that you're not looking down as much as possible that you can just kind of stay up and again be kind of mindful of that posture. So next we're going to do a little neck stretch but we're also going to work our arms at the same time. So if you're able you're going to put your arms out to your side and we're going to go ahead and just turn our neck and look over your left fingers 
And if at any point you need to put your hands down, go for it. But we're just gonna hold this stretch for a few seconds. Again, nice deep breaths. Think about that posture. Your core is engaged, your back is straight, your shoulders are back. And then you can look forward and we're gonna go ahead and look over the right hand. And again, getting that nice stretch through the neck and also really working the arms here, getting those muscles to kick in a little bit. Good, you can go ahead and put those arms down and shake them out. We're gonna do some wrist stretches. So wrists take the brunt of computers, typing, cell phones. So you're gonna put your hands together out in front of you and you're gonna bring your elbows up and you're gonna feel a stretch right in this forearm. And again, really just a nice stretch to do throughout the day. Prevent all those wrist injuries. And then we can go ahead and we can reverse this. And we're gonna have our fingers pointing down, our backs of our hands together. And again, just pushing those hands into each other and get a nice stretch right through here. And I like these exercises. You can really do these anywhere and really incorporate them into your day. So again, kind of put them down, you can shake it out. We're gonna do a little trunk stretching. So what I'm gonna have you do is take your right hand and put it on your left knee. Take your left hand and reach for your chair. And you're gonna go ahead with your right hand and just kind of push and rotate your trunk to the left. Again, just keeping that back nice and straight and just get a nice rotation through that spine. And these should feel really good. And again, just hold it for 15, 20 seconds. Just feel like you're getting a really nice stretch. And then you can come back to the center and we can go the other side. So your left hand to your right knee, your right hand to the chair, and you're gonna twist. And it's not uncommon that you would notice one side may feel a little bit more tight than the other. That's pretty normal. And just taking some nice deep breaths. Don't hold your breath with any of these exercises. Great, you can come back to center and we're just gonna do some stretches for our legs. So first one we're gonna do is a figure four. I'm just gonna have you put your left, or excuse me, my right ankle over my left knee. And then I can use my hands to push down on that right knee if I want a little bit more of a stretch. And again, this stretch is great when you're sitting all day, those muscles that get really tight, so this helps to stretch them out. And again, just whole time kind of thinking about that posture. You don't wanna be slouched over, sit up nice and straight. Okay. You can go ahead and switch sides, so the left ankle over the right knee, and we can use the hands to push that left knee down towards the floor and just get that nice stretch through the upper leg and hip. Great, you can go ahead and shake that out. We're gonna do a hamstring stretch. So you can put your left foot out forward. Okay, keep your right foot on the ground and you're gonna bend your left toes towards you. Again, keeping your back straight. If you're not getting much of a stretch, you can lean forward a little bit at the waist too. That'll bring the stretch up higher in the back of the leg. Okay. And then we can go ahead and switch sides. So the right foot out, bending the toes towards us, and lean forward if you want that little bit of an extra stretch. And that is it. So add these exercises in throughout your day. Keep moving. Remember to take some breaks all the time. If you feel like you're having any pain or limitations, don't hesitate to talk to one of your physicians about it. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference.